Hey guys, what's up? This video is brought to you by Linode Cloud Computing. If you guys are looking to host your website out there so everybody can see it, I recommend you check them out. They're going to save you a ton of money over Azure AWS. They have products that pretty much suit anybody from small developers to large corporations. They have data centers around the world and they're continuing to grow all the time. And they also have a YouTube channel that you guys can check out if you're interested in hearing more about their products directly from them. Hey everybody, what's up? All right, so in this video, what I want to try to do is sum up the current state of Python web development in 2020 right now and what is the best web framework to use and really what is the best one when it comes to a sync and a wait. So the three main web frameworks out there for Python that I'll compare is Django, probably the largest, most popular one. And I've been talking about it for like a decade now. And then there's Flask. And I've been talking about this one for a long time too. Everybody knows about this. And you guys are probably like, why am I even comparing this? Because there's so many uh, videos that compare these two. But then there's the new kid on the block, which is Fast API, And this is the real one that I want to talk about in this comparison. So I won't compare like all the features of all three of them um, or any of that stuff just because that would be a really long, boring video. But let's talk about Fast API and what this thing brings to the table over Django and Flask. And that is the async await uh, support, right? So Python has async await support going back a couple years now. Uh, looks like 3.7 plus is when they first added async await. I could be wrong on that. But the problem with async await is the global interpreter lock. Really, you know, Python is an old language. It goes back to 1990. Back in 1990, everybody was using just one CPU core. And then over the years, we stopped making CPU cores faster, and we spent more time making, uh, making multi-core you know, multi processors so you could actually run a bunch of tasks simultaneously. And Python, though, wasn't designed to do something as simple as what I described. And really, it's because the sync await stuff, concurrency uh, stuff, is not simple at all. Anybody that tells you that that's simple, they've never really worked on a real like concurrent system. They've never had to like find the needle in the haystack type bugs uh, for just you know these runtime errors that are occurring. Um, so I feel like anybody that says that it is simple is just they have no idea what they're talking about. A sync await concurrency. Uh, parallel processing, all that stuff is is complicated. And the way Python was written, it makes it really hard to add asynchronous support to the Python code base. So we use this like product to sync IO, but the main reason why it's such a problem is this global interpreter lock that we've always had in the Python library. So basically context switching is what Python does when it, it, it executes multi-threads and um, it has to switch between these threads, so context switching is actually storing state. And it, there's basically a bunch of overhead, and even for idle processes, Python will still do context switching. So no matter what anybody says, you know, there's going to be articles that say Python does this or that. You just have to install this or hack it this way or that way. Like Python is not going to compete when it comes to other uh, languages that have implemented a sync await a little bit better. I would say like C Sharp, probably Rust, uh, GoLang, any of that stuff is is going to be a little bit easier to do concurrent programming than python so i think when it comes to really when you're picking the stack for what do you want to choose i would still use django if like i had to set this thing up beside behind a uh, like a relational database if i were going to be building any sort of like news website like a blog i would say like even my online educational platform i would be able to do that in django although i chose node and sjs but like Django is still a good option for something like that. And then the same could be said for Flask, right? Flask, its big thing is like, we're not Django. Um, we're very easy to use and, and within like one file you could get up and running, but we're not Django, we're not so complicated, we're not so big, right? But then every application eventually becomes this big monolith and you end up having to tack all this stuff onto it anyway. So Django, for the most part, is including a lot of stuff you're gonna need in the end. Large companies use both of these products. I mean, Flask is used by Netflix and Django is used by Instagram. And you could name a bunch of big companies that are using you know, both of these projects for little things you know, here and there. But both of the projects suffer when it comes to a sync and a wait. And I would avoid both of them if you're looking to go in that direction. And that is where Fast API comes in. So this is a new project that is actually also built on a bunch of different projects as well. Like Flask gets a lot of credit 
as a web framework, but it's really built on WorkZoog as like the primary server backend. So Fast API is really no different. It's built on a framework that's called Starlet, and this is another new Python framework. And this guy is built and with with this ASCII module in mind. And what is ASCII? This is where like things get even more complicated. When you used to set up a Python web stack, like I used to use uWSGI and ModWSGI and all these different WSGIs, but WSGIs are, they're a web server gate, they're really just a communication protocol so that Python can communicate with a web server like Apache. So in the old days, we used uWSGI, ModWSGI, and those are all synchronous models. And Starlet uses this new ASCII model, which Django also says that it supports, but the problem is Django does not support the await feature. So you can do something asynchronous, but you can never await for something. Like it, it, it's not really like a, a, a true solution for using ASCII at the moment. Hopefully that changes in the future, but um, then again, neither is really Flask. So when it comes down to it, the reason why you wanna use Fast API, which uses Starlet, which uses this ASCII, which is actually using something called Uvicorn. And Uvicorn is, it really goes ASCII, Uvicorn, Starlet, Fast API. But why do we do that? It's because it's faster. So let's go ahead and look up, like uh, here's a benchmark list. This is one of the most, um, you know, really it's from Tech Power, Tech and Power, but it, they do the best job, I think, when it comes to listing all the different benchmarks. The bottom line is that like Flask and Django, they're down towards the bottom, especially if you're communicating with a database. You can see Django's at 345, even lower. And then if we look at something like, uh, if we look for Fast API, um, and in here with J, it's gonna be quite a bit faster. And then here's Fast API at 228. So I'll, it's much, much faster than Django or Flask. So to sum this up, this Uvicorn is an ASCII web server. ASCII over a uh, WSGI, <laughs> that, it, the difference is asynchronous versus asynchronous. The A in there is for asynchronous. Now, right away with this project, one of the problems with Uvicorn is that you can see HTTP uh, 2 is still a planned support. So again, very much similar to the way Flask is built on WorkZoog. Uh, Star, like uh, I'm sorry, Fast API is built on top of Starlet. So you could actually jump in and start working with Starlet directly, which has ASCII support using Uvicorn. And here's an example of an app uh, that is using Starlet. So this is just going to be just a simple, you're defining your response to return a JSON data, and it has JSON serialization as well. And it also has built-in debugging support too. So like you can get actual error messages and such. Instead of just getting a 500 error message, it's gonna you know, spit out whatever the, the stack trace is. And that's really helpful when it comes to debugging. So basically I'm in a virtual environment right now. So I'll go ahead and uh, spin this up. So I just say Uvicorn start the app. It listens on localhost 8000. And here you can see when we navigate to the local host, we get our hello world back. We also have all the headers and everything already written for us too. So it's returning application uh, JSON data there. So a lot of stuff that you don't have to write if you just want a basic web server up and running. Starlet can also use template engines like Jinja 2. And that's also pretty awesome as well. So if, if you're a, a fan of Django template engine, which I think is the best template engine of all of them, uh, I love Jinja 2 because I, I can use that outside of a Django project. But in addition to actually returning HTML, uh, JSON data, connecting to databases or whatever, all this stuff can be run as sync and await. And then um, the uh, it has static file supports as well. So here's like a, a CSS file in here so I can turn my H1 and I'll go ahead and just show you that. So I'll just jump back over, run my templates app. I, I don't have my virtual environment running inside VS Code, which is why I'm switching back to my command line. And I'll take a look here and we got uh, uh, CSS template engine, like I said, uh, that's how you return JSON data. You can connect that to a database, get full async await, deploy it to an ASCII web server, and you can get much, much faster Python. So if Starlet can do all that stuff, then why do we need Fast API? And the, the answer to that question is Fast API takes Starlet and does so much more. So it's relying upon Starlet, but it's extending it by quite a bit. So you can see this is the logical progression. 
So just a couple of those things that it does extra is it has uh, testing support, but it's also using PyTest for that. It has a dependency to even use PyTest. I think it uses eight uh, requests, which is a popular library. I have tutorials on that. As far as validation for form validation or serialization, then that is using Pydantic. So the bottom line though, is that uh, this will do a whole lot more. So you need database drivers, you need to do like cores, headers, all this stuff. Like you're gonna need to run in, you're gonna run into those problems and have to write some code eventually. And you can see fast API, API is basically just stating, look, we're just extending what Starlet is not doing. So another thing that fast API does is type hints. And you can see here that this was added in recent support. So it's ver new in version 3.5 and um, open or fast, I keep saying open API, I'm so used to that, but fast API is taking advantage of that. And it, it's able to provide type hinting now. And that it, it makes it a lot easier when you're dealing with linting tools and uh, just trying to catch type errors as they occur. So this is an example of adding type hinting and then now being able to see inside VS Code uh, a much more friendly IntelliSense using Python. So another reason to use Fast API is that by the time you're done with your project, if you're going to be building a cutting edge project, project, especially using a sync await, you're trying to make it as fast as you possibly can. Maybe you're building your own CDN or just like you're going to have massive amounts of traffic. Otherwise, like if you don't have a bunch of traffic, then why would you add all these headaches? So the point is that you're probably going to be trying to build something badass and cutting edge. And if there's a project template already out there that's taking all these like tools and they've already wired them all together, do you want to spend a month figuring that shit out or you just want to download it and use it? And that like that's what this provides. That's what Nest.js provides as well for Node and that's why I'm using it. But um, this like project template right here will save you a ton of time. Now it's somewhat opinionated with the view front end, but like there's plenty of tutorials to show how to rip out view and put in Angular or React if you want to. But that's like the least of your concerns when you're really trying to build a full stack application in Python that's using a sync await, the ASCII, uh, you know, web server gateway interface. And then uh, to have JWT token authentication and course headers and all that stuff, then it's going to save you a lot of time. So for example, this is a project template that is using fast API with Postgres. It's got a user authentication model. So you need to have users register, uh, deal with groups, uh, roles, things like that, super users. It's got a built-in admin. And uh, you know, you're know you either gonna write that yourself or you might as well just use this. All right, so that's gonna wrap up my video. It really boils down when you're comparing the three. Am I looking for speed and a sync await? If you are, then you're definitely going with fast API. If you need speed, but a synchronous model is gonna work for you, I would say Flask is gonna be better than Django if it's a basic application. If you're trying to build something like the, you know, the New York Times, you need a, somebody that like, you have writers that are going in and, and dealing with media and writing stuff and WYSIWYGs, all that crap, like I would go with Django, especially if you're using a relational database model. So is this going to be the future? It probably will be. Python's definitely going in the async await direction. It's going much slower than some of the other languages, but Python's still super popular, so it's going to be around. I think these projects are all three going to be around for a long time. We're going to continue to see more async await support with Django. One of the best things about Django is that it actually moves so slowly. They've always had a very good community that's been... Um, they've always looked at backwards compatibility as being important because it, it always pisses developers off when there's like these small changes that kind of don't really need to be there. They're just like very semantic and just meaningless. But if it breaks like your code and you have to update, you know, 50 modules or something, then, you know, people get pissed off, right? But your backwards compatibility is a big thing. It's something that our JavaScript community knows nothing about, but Django definitely does. All right, so if you guys are trying to learn web development with me, go to my website, codehawk.com, check out my courses. I got a bunch of different courses, really that start from like basic web development, kind of moving up into the server-side frameworks. It goes full stack, so you can even see me like de deploying projects and stuff. But um, just, yeah, check that out. I'm adding courses there all the time.